Good morning, church. It's a fine Sunday morning, and you're a fine congregation. And we have a, a fine God who loves us very much. What can make away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow.
He wants to steal our peace. And he wants to steal our joy. And what does he want to kill? Well, he wants to kill your soul. He wants to kill your soul. Kill your spirit. And what does he want to destroy? Your mind. Your hope. He wants to destroy your faith. I want to remind you of another scripture in the book of John. John 8, 44. John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. This is describing Satan. We simplify things sometimes just to remind ourselves. If Satan's lips are moving, he's lying. There's no truth in him. And there's scripture for that right there. See, Satan's goal is to defeat, kill, steal, and destroy the Christian. And Satan knows that in order for us to be the victims of his plans and his plots, that we must, first of all, we're going to have to sin then fail to repent. Deceive ourselves as to our standing with God. Or busy ourselves with things that have no eternal value. So what are Satan's favorite sins? Any sin that will trap you into this pattern of sinning, failing to repent, deceiving yourself as to where you are, and then busying yourself with things that have no eternal value. But I am going to explore several of these sins specifically. It is my purpose in doing this to remind you that Satan never gives up trying to defeat you. He will not stop trying to get you bound to his punishment in eternity. As long, or he won't stop it until God sends Jesus back to rapture his Now, I'm not, I'm not listing any of these sins in a specific order saying this is worse than that. I'm just giving you information about them. If you want to categorize them as to which is the worst and which is the least worst, because they're all bad. All sin separates us from God. And God says that no sin will enter into his holy presence. I want to begin today in Hebrews chapter 3. And I promise you we're not going to spend a long time. And I hope by now you know that my promises are worth something. Hebrews chapter 3, let's begin in verse number 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, 
in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Now let's look at that picture for just a little while. God had just set the children of Israel free from Egyptian bondage. And he was leading them to their promised land. That land that was promised to Abraham and to his seed after him forever. And they, as a people, kept complaining and whining and griping. And it, it grieved God. It grieved God. He was supplying them with everything they needed for life, and still they wouldn't trust Him. They still kept looking back to something else. They kept focusing back on a time when, when, when they were slaves and, and even preferring that over what they had. And we talked about it in the, in the Sanctuary Sunday School class today. It was because they would rather go back and live under bondage than live by faith. And so God finally said, I've had enough of them. They're not going to enter into my rest. And Scripture tells us that that generation didn't enter into the promised land and they didn't enter in because of what? Unbelief. So, now to the Hebrew church in verse 12, he says, Take heed, brethren. Take heed, brother. Pay attention. Wake up. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. The word of God ties unbelief to an evil heart. It says, lest there be any of you, in any of you, an evil heart of unbelief, in departing from the living God. See, unbelief is withdrawing from God's promise. It's withdrawing from faith. It's withdrawing from hope. And Satan wants you to live in a place of unbelief. I was having a discussion with a young minister this week. I've been mentoring this young man for about three years now. And he's, he's facing a difficulty with the people that he's ministering to. Because the, the group that he's ministering to, they believe that all the works of the Holy Spirit <coughs> ended back in the first generation church. And specifically what they're, what they're bowing up against and what they're having difficulty with is this thing called tongues. And because they, they can't accept tongues, they can't accept the Holy Ghost dwelling in a person. And so this young minister is trying, he's, what do I do, Brother Bill? What do I do, Brother Bill? I said, you continue to teach and preach the Word of God. Don't argue with them and don't condemn them. Just continue to teach them the truth. Because the Bible says you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's the truth that's going to set you free. And what is untruth? It's unbelief. It's unbelief. He says in verse 13, verse 13 he said, But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. I'm going to say this again. Satan will never show up at your house 
with his pitchfork and his red suit on and say, hey, I'm here and it's time for you to start living differently. He'll never do that. He comes in through deceit, cunning. He comes in through questions being asked that shouldn't even be asked. It should never be a situation in our world where we have to say this life matters or that life matters. Can I get an amen? amen. But we go around asking questions and bringing up things that are not supposed to even be brought up. God tells us in the Word, there are some things that just never be discussed. Hello? Nobody in Hollywood seems to understand that. And unfortunately, a lot of our pastors don't seem to understand that. Some of our theologians don't either. For we are made partakers of Christ. We are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Haven't we seen many and many a person start off with a fire of God burning in them? Working for the kingdom of God, building for the kingdom of God, and then boom! Where are they at? What happened to them? See, they didn't hold on to what they got to the end. And one of the things that erodes away your faith, erodes away your hope, erodes away your joy, is unbelief. Amen? conversation was brought to me this week about why should I build my life based on the Bible. And I said, because it's the only thing that has proven steadfast generation by generation by generation. Amen. Yes. And notice that even in our generation, in our time, the Word of God is being attacked in more ways than you'd ever believe. And not always by the obvious people that you would think be doing it. I pointed out to you several places in several of the translations where there is there are parts of God's Word that have been erased by translation. Church, how hard is it to change in your mind the word ye into you? It's not, is it? But so many people that condemn certain translations of the Bible, the reason they condemn it is over trivia like that. Well, I just don't understand that old English. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I don't think a lot of us really understand English at all. <laughs> In any version. From any generation. Amen? And I'm just saying that to be comical. But at the same time, I do want you to realize. If you say, I can't understand this translation, aren't you really saying that you just don't want to believe that translation? Isn't there a level, minor or not, there's a level of unbelief. And yes, I point out things in the King James that are subject to interpretation and were proven so by the ones that turned it from Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek into English for us. I'm not, I'm not prejudiced towards just one Bible. But we need to understand that we need to hold our faith steadfast. It's, you see, if we can get the Bible to be inconsistent, then that gives the devil another tool of unbelief. Gives him another weapon of un unbelief. And I don't know how many times people go, well, I don't know who to believe. 
You tell me one thing, Brother Bill, and this guy on the television tells me this, this guy on the radio tells me this, and this book I'm reading tells me, well, who do I believe? You have to be led by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And in order to be led by the Holy Spirit, you have to walk in that place that God says we must walk in. That place of always, always being humble before God. When a sin occurs in our life, fall and repent right then and there. Call out that very moment. Don't deceive yourself thinking you're in a better place than what you are. We must hold steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if we'll hear his voice, and don't harden our hearts like they did in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Only all, all, a whole generation didn't make it to the promised land. Why didn't they make it to the promised land? Unbelief. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? He said, God's not grieved with everybody. Did you know God's not mad at you today? No. God's not mad at his church today. God's not upset with us. He loves us. And God's wanting to warn us about Satan's newest tactics. The subject of unbelief. Let's just take one category in our current situation. I've read just as much about the harm of wearing a mask. And I've read it from people who are educated and people who are in the medical profession and people who have a very valid argument. And then I've heard the other side of the story. So much so that even our governor says, if you go out in public, you have to wear a mask. That's what he says. Did y'all know that? So who are you gonna believe? Which side of the story are you going to believe? And since this whole virus thing started, there have been dozens and dozens and dozens of totally different reports being brought to us all on a daily basis. I was sitting listening to it or watching a television broadcast the other day, and in the same broadcast on the same channel with the same people, I heard two completely conflicting stories. They didn't point it out that they were conflicting. But even the, even the lady who was doing the speaking, she kept getting that eyebrow raised and that furrowed brow because she was realizing, wait a minute, just a few minutes ago I was reporting the other side of this completely different. She, she realized it, but that was a script. That was long before, so that's what she said. Who has God grieved with? He's grieved with the unbeliever. So, so unbelief can be seen. Think about it. Jesus says if you come to the altar and you confess and you repent, I'll save you. But if you don't believe that, Think about these people that were in the wilderness. When they got up in the morning, they had, they had been, 
the whole night had passed with this light of God leading them and protecting them and covering them. And when they get up in the morning, then there's a cloud. A pillar of cloud, a big long pillar of light unto the fire only for the daytime version. And it was there to lead them and guide them and protect them. And when they were thirsty, God let them go on. And when they're hungry, he gave them food. And when they got tired of bread, he gave them meat. But everything they needed to survive, he gave them. And still they couldn't believe in him. I've seen miracles in my life. You have too. I know others that have seen the same miracles we've seen, but they just don't believe them. I was asking, Brother Bill, how is it that you know that Jesus is real? And I said, oh, that's an easy one. I know that he's real because he lives in my heart. Yes. I know that he's real because I know what I was before I knew him, and I knew what I am in knowing him. Yes. And I've had... So many experiences where when I call his name, awe and in tragedy, in fear, in worry, in doubt, all I had to do was call the name of Jesus and wow, things change. And especially in me. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? but to them that believe not. How many of you have ever heard that verse that says you have not because you ask not? We've all heard it, haven't we? Do we believe it? We put it to the test around here a few times, haven't we? We've asked God for the impossible to take place. The medically impossible. The financially impossible. The emotionally impossible. And even the spiritually impossible. We've seen God save people that we didn't think could be saved. We've seen God heal people that we didn't think could be healed. We've seen do things in the healing department that even medicine can't explain how or why. Amen. 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 My own doctor told me I shouldn't, shouldn't have been alive. My heart should have taken me just like that. Not, not the doctor, but one of his staff told me that they had never seen a heart as stopped up as my heart was, except on an autopsy day. I said, Doc, how do we explain it then? He said, well, he said, preacher, he said, I shouldn't have to tell you this. <laughs> I said, I know that. He said, the only way I can explain it is a miracle. Yes. The only way you can explain it. And that's a man that works in people's hearts every day of the year. Takes care of hundreds and thousands of people. Several years, or not several years, but a couple of years after. He fixed my heart. I was up at that same hospital. I was there because somebody else was having heart problems. And when the doctor that did my heart came in the door, he was their doctor too. And that gave me a great peace of mind. And that doctor came through that door. I hadn't seen him in months. 
But he looked up and saw me, and he came all the way around the bed and came over to where I was, and I had stood up by then, and he hugged me. And then he turned around and he patted me on the chest, and he said, this is one of my success stories. I think, I think there was an impact on that man's life. And it sure, sure impacted mine. You see, unbelief is sneaky. It's deceptive. And with all the voices, the voices, the voices, the experts, and all the testimonies that are coming at us, bombarding us all the time. Who are we going to believe? Well, brother and sister, I think it's time for the church to just narrow the, the bandwidth right down to the very crux of the matter and say, if it's not in God's word, I'm not going to believe it. But if it is in God's word, I'm going to believe it, and I'm going to act upon it, and I'm going to share it, and I'm going to enjoy it with as many as I can. Amen. Remember that list that I gave you at the beginning? The things that Satan can't do? He can't stop you from praying. He can't stop God from healing you and forgiving you. He can't change his future. He can't stop you from believing either. But when we do, we're not careful. He'll maneuver us into that place. Of, not a lot of unbelief, just a little unbelief. I've had people say, well, I believe God can heal that person over there, but God's not going to heal me. And I tell the person, as long as you don't believe God's going to heal you, you're right. He's not going to heal you. Because unbelief is blocking the blessing of God. Sometimes as I go before God, I'm like that man in the Bible. I just say, God, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Help me to believe that even if it's an allergy or even if it's a... <clears throat> Yesterday I was put to the test. My faith was put to the test. It did be anything, but it was still put to the test. I had been out in the garden harvesting my miniature zucchinis. <laughs> By the way, they're out there on the porch. Please take them home. All of them. Take as many as you want. I'll have more. But I had taken a, a jug of water out of the refrigerator and I carried it out there with me because you're supposed to stay hydrated and I try to follow all the rules. And I'd worked my three or four minutes and I was setting down my five minutes and that's about how I'm going to do things right now. But this jug of water was sitting on the ground next to me and it condensation had just covered it. And... Uh, I reached down to pick it up, give it a drink. Didn't bother looking. I just, I knew where I sat. I reached down to pick it up. And a red wasp was giving him a sip of that pollen. And he didn't like the fact that I was interfering with his beverage. And so he got right here on my little finger and he just started popping me just as fast and as furiously as <coughs> I didn't have time to think about solutions. I'm not prone to running and screaming. I'm just not. When you get as big and as old as I am, running and screaming is off the plate. I mean, it's just out of My first thought was, was I'm, gonna, I'm just going to kill it. And as I reached to get him, you know, I was just going to grab him and kill him. I've done that. I don't know how many times I've done that. He's, he's popped me about three or four times by this time. And as I was going from here to here, I just said, Jesus, help me. That's all I said. And I promise you, he stopped stinging me. And he turned his head to look at me. <laughs> and I thumped him off of my finger. Now you, you, you come up here and examine my 
my hand. There's one little bump. I mean, little, 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 tiny, tiny bump. And you and I both know that a red wasp don't need a little, little, tiny bump. But I believe it was because I believed in the name of Jesus, and I called on the name of Jesus, and I declared the name of Jesus. Even in the little things. No pain today, no difficulty, no nothing. Come on. I'm just using that as an example to show you that even in the little things, God wants us to believe. And to call on his name. To stand in our faith. To keep our hope alive. And when we get into the big things like what's going on in our country today, folks, I just tell you, we really need to depend on God. Amen. Amen. Now this morning, we're blessed to have communion prepared. And so I would ask if a couple of y'all would come and serve the communion. I'm assuming we set it up like we did last time, sister. Yes. Amen. So there are two cups. The top cup has the wine in it, the bottom, and they're together. The, the top cup is on top of the bread in the bottom of the cup. So let's just go ahead and serve right now as fast as we can. One of the things that Jesus talked about and what Paul shared with the Corinthian church when he was explaining to them communion he warned them. He said, don't eat or drink of the cup. Eat the bread. Don't, 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 don't partake. Unworthily. Or in unbelief. He said, let a man examine himself. Did you know that the only judge you really have to worry about is yourself? You need to judge yourself. You need to judge yourself right now. And before we actually partake of Holy Communion, let's take a moment to give each other time to examine ourselves. And while I pray, then we'll share Holy Communion. Father, we open ourselves before you right now in belief and in faith, asking you, God, to reveal anything in our life that you're unhappy with, anything that displeases you, anything that is sin. And we ask you, Lord, we ask you, Lord, to hear our plea and hear our cry of repentance as we come before you today and we say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for my unbelief. Forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for my shame. Forgive me for the things that, that I've done that have been a disgrace to you. Oh, dear Father, forgive me today. Wash me in the blood of your Son, Jesus, and make me whole and pure in your eyes. I ask this by faith in the holy name of Jesus. And all of God's children say, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Jesus came to this earth as a servant. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's you, that's me, and all the others that have come through the, the narrow In Jesus Christ. He brought his closest to him the night he was betrayed. And he said, look, I took a piece of bread, and I want you to know that I am making this bread to represent my body, which is broken for you. And he said, this do in remembrance of me. I could spend a whole day telling you about all the pain and agony and difficulties that were on the body of Jesus and the stripes that were placed there.
the nails, the thorns, the spear, all those things. That was all done to heal us and to heal our body and even to heal our nation. Let's hold the symbol of the body of Jesus as we pray today. Father, we do remember and we do appreciate and we glorify you, God, and we thank you, God, that you allowed your son Jesus to go through such physical torture in his body so that our bodies could have an avenue of healing. The outward man could be healed. The physical man could be healed because of the body of Jesus and what he went through. Bless now this symbol as we partake it in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Let us partake. And then he took the cup. And he said, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood. There wasn't blood in the cup. The fruit of the vine was in the cup. It was representative of the blood of Jesus. The blood that followed God's law. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There is no elimination of sin. Sin cannot be conquered without blood. Jesus came willing and allowed his blood to flow so that my sin and your sin could be eradicated never to be remembered against us again. Amen? Amen. Let's hold the symbol. Father, we raise this cup. We raise it before you in gratitude, in joy, to exalt you, to praise you, to thank you, to adore you, not only that God you would allow it to happen, but Jesus you were willing for it to happen. We know that it was your love that held you to the cross, not the nails. And you loved us because you knew that there would be generations and generations of people that would still come to God by faith in that precious atoning blood. The songwriter said, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And we hold this symbol before you now, asking you to bless it into our body as we're renewed in our spirit and renewed in our body through those blessed blessings of God. Bless now this symbol as we take it in the holy name of Jesus. Let us partake. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Folks. Let's pull together spiritually like we've never pulled together before. Let's believe for every person we know to be, to be protected from this virus. Let's believe for those that have already got it to be healed and not to have any of the, of the terrible, terrible experiences. One lady that we've been praying for is supposed to find out tomorrow. Tomorrow is supposed to be her report that she's contracted the disease that she's weathered the disease, and tomorrow she's supposed to be declared virus free. Amen. We've been praying for her. This church has been praying for her for weeks now. We're believing. We're believing. We're believing. And with that report, when that report comes back positive, her husband gets to go back to work. And I don't know about it is, you know, around your house, but around their house, they need the income coming in from work. And he's anxious to get back to work. Thank you for praying. Let's pull together in prayer. Like, even though we can't be here together like we'd like to be, we can't have, we, there's some restrictions. And, and let's don't even call them restrictions. Let, let's just say we're being careful, being wise. And let's walk through this thing together. And let's spend a little more time praying for me. I know that sounds selfish, but, you know, I need it. This, is, this has been grievous on me. Amen? But I know it's been grievous on you, so I'm praying for you. I'm asking for you. Let's just pull it. Amen? Amen? In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Brother Joe, would you dismiss our meeting today? I have not, 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 I
for this time to come to your house and worship. We praise you and ask that you stay with us each and every moment of the day as we go through this time of mystery. Again, we thank you and praise you for all things. In the name of Yeshua, our Shield, our beloved Jesus.